uh, back. Amazing. Mission accomplished. It is a phrase that elicits emotion, correct? I mean, we think of mission accomp accomplished and it signals victory. It signals growth. It signals accomplishment. I want to tell you a story about 12 years ago, I was living in Dawson City, Yukon with Stephanie. We were engaged at the time and uh, we were working for a hotel that was part of the Holland America Cruise Line. And so this really was, uh, this really was uh, a kind of a cruise that was catered to some retired Americans and uh, that was the clientele 99.9% .9 of the time. And so basically people would take the cruise boat up along the western coast of North America and they would get to a port in Alaska and then they would get off the boat and there was an inland tour going through Alaska and the Yukon and so we were one of the stops on that tour and uh, I was living in staff accommodation kind of like university residence and there was a guy in my staff you know hall and uh, his name was Owen and he was a good friend of mine I loved him dearly but he was an idiot <laughs> All right, uh, he was like the definition of aloof, all right? So like he was, he was a server at the restaurant, but not for very long because he would take somebody's order and then he would just completely forget that they were actually there. He never brought them their food. Uh, along with being super aloof, he made several uh, terrible life decisions, uh, the most pertinent of which to this morning is the fact that he was a vegan. Um, I would apologize for saying that, but I have purposed in my heart not to lie to you today. And so he had uh, you know, chosen to become a vegan. And so where he uh, got a lot of his protein in life was through uh, nuts and nut products and you may or may not be familiar with the fact that that's a problem for me and we're living in this residence together and he's completely aloof like he just forgets all the time and I try and explain to him Owen this is a big deal you have to clean up after yourself and like undoubtedly every day I would come home and his dishes would be just sitting in the sink like covered in peanut butter, like just a lather on the, on the knife that I'm supposed to clean now. And like I'm having some sort of allergic reaction to being in my home. And so I tried the talking method. I really did. Several times. It didn't work. I worked in the kitchen that summer. And, uh, and I developed a plan. I developed a plan. You see, every day I was the breakfast cook and we would have leftover bacon from the buffet. And so I filled the takeout box with leftover bacon and bacon grease and I brought it home and I put it all over Owen's bed and I covered it and the room just smelled of bacon. It was a beautiful thing. And I, and I left a note on his pillow and it said, do your dishes, there's more where this came from. He was so angry with me that he did not talk to me for three days, but it worked. He never forgot to do his dishes again. Mission accomplished. <laughs> my mission was to preserve my life, and my vision was the way that I saw that happening. Perhaps it was ill-advised, but nonetheless, it was effective. You know, we've been here now for about uh, four months, and I think that it's fair to say that we've grown. I think it's fair to say that we've grown in relationship with one another, that we have grown in trust, that we have grown in, I, I feel like there's this growing desire to experience the presence of God together and this desire to impact our community and share it with them. You know, we started uh, very shortly after I arrived, a 30-day prayer movement, and, and Bruce is here in the back. And Bruce, can you remind me of what you said to me? Do you remember what you said? I'm oh, totally amazed. He said... This is what Bruce said to me. That was the Sunday morning version. Here's the real version. And Bruce said to me, Pastor Kyle's either really in tune with what God is saying or he's a complete idiot. <laughs> and what was my response, Bruce? One of the two. It's one of the two. But you know what? We went through this time together as a church family, and I think it was just absolutely amazing that we met together. We built new relationships. We prayed through the same scripture together, and what continued to come up over and over and over again, I believe, was the heart that God is laying on us, the vision that he has for our church in this community in this time. And as we finished that, here's my copy of the report. 
because all of the people who participated were a part of a group and reports were made. And as a leadership, we have poured over these, we have prayed through them, we have made notes. And what is clear to us is that God has laid it on all of our hearts, the same themes coming out again and again and again. And I want to share those with you today. Confession time. We plagiarized our mission statement. But we plagiarized it from the word of God, so I think it's okay. Here's what you need to know. Our mission is to love God, love others, and make disciples. You need to know that, you need to know that because we are taking aim. And everything that we do as a church is focused on moving us toward loving God, loving others, and making disciples. And our vision, the way that we see that happening, is taking steps to move closer to Jesus. I want to share with you a short scripture today. It's found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. The words will be up on the screen here. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Go to the next slide. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We need to know that this moment in Scripture really is the culmination of a series of debates that Jesus is having with religious leaders. All right? These are hotly contested moments, and all of them are rooted in challenging the authority of Jesus and his teaching. You see that there are religious leaders who are feeling insecure about the fact that there are people who are now following Jesus and moving away from the way that they think that they should be going. And so their intention in every single one of these interactions is to undermine Jesus' authority, that they are trying to prove him wrong. This is not a moment of having a genuine conversation to get to a result or to clarify. This is to try to make him look foolish so the people that are following him will turn around and go the other way. Now, the first question that they ask Jesus before this happens, the Pharisees and the Herodians, these religious groups, they come up to Jesus and they ask him about paying taxes. They say, is it okay for man to pay taxes to Caesar? Now, you need to understand that they call him teacher, not because they believe he's a teacher. They're trying to disarm him and undermine him. And in this situation, either answer that Jesus provides could be used against him. You see, these people, they are heavily overtaxed. They're struggling to make ends meet. And if Jesus says, yes, you pay your taxes, they are thinking that all of the people that are following Jesus will be inclined to walk away from him because they'll think, did he actually just say that? Does he not know how difficult life is and how we're trying to make it work for a family? But if Jesus responds to that question as to whether or not he, they should be paying taxes, if he says no, that could be seen as a challenge to the Roman Empire. Right? Jesus is challenging the authority of the Roman Empire. So they feel like no matter how he responds, they've got him either way. And Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. They're amazed and they weren't quite expecting that response. They didn't really know how to handle that response. And so they kind of slink away. But there's another group waiting in the wings called the Sadducees. And they come into the temple. Jesus is in the temple at this time. And the temple is like the Sadducees' home. All right? They are devout. They are religious. And they come into the temple and they ask Jesus this question about marriage at the resurrection. You need to understand that Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They only believe the word of God in the Pentateuch. That is the first five books of the Bible. And the doctrine of resurrection is all throughout the New Testament. And it is in the Old Testament as well, but not in the Pentateuch. And so they're asking this disingenuous question about marriage at the resurrection. You see, there was this Jewish law that said that if a man were to marry a woman and they were not to have children, but he has a brother, then his brother should marry that woman after he dies, right? Like, aren't you thankful that that's not a law that we're held to right now, right? But the spirit of the law is that there would be care for the widow. 
and that there would be protection for the family line, and so that would continue. But these Sadducees, they come into the temple, and they interrupt Jesus while he's teaching, and they ask him this question about marriage and the resurrection. They say if there's a man who dies and he has married a a woman, but he has six brothers and none of them end up having children with this woman, whom will she be married to in heaven? Now, Jesus kind of addresses the question, but he really gets to the heart of the question because they're hypocrites. They're not actually asking the question to learn. They're trying to trap Jesus theologically. They're trying to establish that Jesus is not a legitimate theological leader, and so that he cannot challenge their authority and their teaching. Jesus responds to this question kind of by touching on the marriage issue, but what he really does is that he highlights that all of Scripture is holy. And he says to them that they don't know the Scriptures, and they don't know the power of God. He quotes from the Pentateuch, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What's he saying? He's saying that the God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, present tense. And the crowd is amazed, and yet again, they slink away. So the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees that came up first, it's commonly thought that that they were kind of the newer Pharisees, that they were the Pharisees in training. And so here we arrive at our text, this moment, which really is this culmination of a series of challenges put before Jesus. And the word tells us that when they had been silenced, the Pharisees gathered together. Now, this is not a polite gathering. They're coming together with nefarious intention to try to stump and test Jesus. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Which is the greatest commandment? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. The message tells us that they gathered together for an assault. The person that was a Pharisee that was elected to go and try to stump Jesus, he's called a religious scholar, an expert in the law. He is a lawyer, and he is there to show Jesus up, and he asks the question, which is the greatest in the law? Now, the law here, is a shorthand for the entire Old Testament. There's this ongoing debate among the Jewish community within every single sect. There's this ongoing debate among scholars and common Jews alike, and it's this. Which of the 613 laws we find in the Jewish scripture is the greatest? Which of the 613 laws is the least? Which is the most important? Which is the least? Which is the hardest to do? Which is the easiest to do? And this is an ongoing daily conversation, and they try to rank them. This is what's going on in culture at that time. And he comes to Jesus, and he asks this question, which is the greatest? Now, of those 613, there are 248 positive Uh, instructions, commands from God, and there are 365 negatives. Don't do the following one for every day of the year. And I really don't know why God had more notes than do's, but he did. The result is that an an incautious reply would have resulted in the appearance of Jesus annulling the law. What did he just say? What did the teacher just say? What did the pastor just say? Did you hear what's, what's going on? These, these people are here with nefarious intention. They're, they're doing what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs is an abomination to God. They are sowing seeds of division. Jesus replies by quoting from the Pentateuch. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is not an uncommon command, and I don't think anybody in the room would have been surprised by Jesus' response. You see, this is what was called the Shema, and it was a Jewish practice to repeat this command twice daily. And many people would have agreed with what Jesus had said, because it asks you to love God, and implicit in this command is the direction to follow the rest of the commands. But Jesus, he continues. Now, 
We need to know, too, that heart, soul, and mind are not three separate components of man, but they're, they're reflective of this loyalty, this ultimate loyalty to God. It's, it's, it's like going all in. It's not, it's not having a superficial commitment. It's going all in. The message tells us that this is the first on any list. But Jesus continues, and he quotes Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says the second is like it. He doesn't say the second is second to it. They are equal, and they both depend on one another. And we know that our neighbor is not just the person that lives in the house beside us. Our neighbor is not just the person who's sitting beside us this morning. Our neighbor is anyone who needs help. On these commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. All of the rest of the law, all of the rest of the 611 commandments remaining depend upon these two things. These two commands are pegs, and everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. Now, Jesus isn't dispensing the other 611 laws, but he is saying that they depend upon these two. And they stand together. It's almost impossible to separate them because you cannot love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind and not love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus expands the initial question. Which is the greatest in all of the law? He expands it to include all of scripture. He says this is the greatest in all of the law and the prophets. Jesus isn't prioritizing love over the law, but love within the law. And he says, within these two, the rest of the Bible is sterile. Hmm. Here's the irony. The two laws that Jesus lists as most important, the foundation, the pegs upon which all of the other law hangs, are the ones that I believe the religious experts are ignoring. The religious leaders were really good at arguing. They're really good at telling people what they should do and what they shouldn't do. They were really good at memorizing the law and policing and enforcing. But in all of that, they missed the spirit of the law. The foundation and the underpinning of the law. The love of God and of others. You know, we could really be good. We could be really good at running programs. We could be really good at having answers and at church management and growth strategies. And we want to be good at those things. We want to be really good at those things, but that is not the mission that God has called us to. God has called us to love him, to love others, and make disciples. And I think as we do that, as we love God and we love others, it's a natural overflow of that love that we have for God, of that love that we have for others, that we would become disciple makers. That we would do what Jesus also said in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, to go into all the world and make disciples. And what's a disciple? A disciple follows Jesus, a disciple serves, and a disciple multiplies. So when we're disciples and disciple makers, we have more people experience opportunities to love God, love others, and become disciple makers. It's not a linear progression, it's circular. Because as we love God with our whole heart and invite people into that opportunity, as we love others in the way that God has demonstrated for us. And as we become disciple makers, we have more people that step into that process for the first time of loving God and loving others. It's not linear, it's circular. And so here's what I think we need to do. I want you to join us. I want you to allow God to stir up some excitement inside of you and partner with us as we take our next steps to accomplish the mission that God has given us. And the way that we see that happening through our vision is taking steps to move closer to Jesus. Because part of being a part of of this church means that we're living out that mission. The church is not a building. The church is not a social club. The church is not here to to seek to entertain you or anywhere else. And I I struggled, I, I wrestled with whether or not to share this story this morning, but shortly after I arrived... And please hear my heart. I'm not, I'm not sharing this because I want to, um, to throw anybody under the bus this morning, but, but I want to just share with you my heart and what I believe is already on our hearts. When I came to uh, Cornerstone, there was somebody who contacted me to do an interview. And they said that their, their rationalization for me doing this interview was that there are a lot of church hoppers in this area. 
And if you were to come and do an interview with us, uh, pr probably quite a few of them would come and start attending your church. And it just sat wrong with me. Because I don't believe that we're here to be the biggest and the best. I don't believe that we're here to entertain. I believe that we're here to train and equip. That there's a desire in our hearts to reach our children and our youth and this community with the message of Jesus. And that our church is a body of people that is sold out to a mission to love God, love others, and make disciples. So we want to take steps closer to Jesus. I want to share with you today a few ideas, some things that we're going to be doing in the next season because it might look different. And it doesn't look different because things have been done poorly in the past. And that's not true. It doesn't look different because things weren't healthy in the past. That's not true. This is an incredibly healthy church that loves the Lord and loves one another. And there's a foundation of health because of Pastor Mike and his ministry and all of the years that he faithfully sowed into this congregation. But as Pastor Jason shared with you just a couple weeks ago, that this is a starting point to adventure. And I don't know if you remember or not, but he had a swear jar for his leadership. That any time they said, that's not the way we did things before, they had to put some money in the swear jar. So I just want to share with you a few things, because we are completely sold out to loving God, loving others, and making disciples, and inviting people to be a part of that mission and experience. And so one thing that I want to share with you today is the Big Give. It's an event that we're going to be using in just over a month and on a yearly basis, where we show our community the radical, generous love of our Father God. I want to invite, invite you to watch this video right now. To provide for their families. People who feel like they have come to an end and have lost all hope sometimes feeling like no one cares. What if there was a way that you could help, that you could be a difference maker? All across our nation, on the first Saturday of June each year, The Big Give, in partnership with local churches of all denominational backgrounds, reaches out to thousands in their communities to show them the unconditional love of God by simply giving for free, asking nothing in return. Very impressed. I can't believe what people have given away for free. Barbecues and furniture and free food, free coffee, free everything. It's quite unbelievable. We invite you to partner with The Big Give in building a bridge to your community. We've seen free garage sales, free car washes, free barbecues and movies in the park. Some churches have provided free haircuts, bouncy castles, face painting, pony rides, while others have held free breakfast, free bike repairs. I saw a post on Facebook. One of my friends shared about this event. Um, and I, I saw many of churches in Ottawa offer free stuff, uh, free coffee free hot dog and one of the church I saw bike repair so I have bike and I use it a lot I'm working Tim Hortons so not enough money you know to go and fix it so it's I'm very appreciate so I found this place and they fixed it so my bike perfect condition right now and I can bike again so I really appreciate it, so I can explain. On the day of the Big Give and in the days afterwards, I was contacted by a number of local pastors who were so excited, saying it was probably the best outreach event they'd ever been a part of. All the information and resources that you need to launch the Big Give in your neighborhood are on our website, thebiggive.ca. Come, join the Big Give generosity movement and build a bridge to the people in your neighborhood. Be the church that is making a difference in your community. Register now at thebiggive.ca. So that's something that we're going to be doing. And as we're there, we want to invite people into a love God experience. And we want to invite people also into a love others experience in small groups. 
Beginning this fall, we're going to be having a church-wide initiative inviting every single person in our church to be a part of it with us, to join us. We are going to be running the Alpha course. We're going to be running that here in our community. We want to invite you, whether you are a person of faith or not, to be here and to invite somebody as well to come and join you. Here's the thing. I believe that it has value for you, whether you are already a follower of Jesus or not. See, if you're not a follower of Jesus, it provides this opportunity for you to express your opinion and have a conversation about faith matters, those big questions in life that we all talk about, that we all wrestle with, but maybe don't feel like we have an opportunity to have those conversations without being yelled at, without it becoming uh, too uh, politically divisive. Does that make sense? And so this is an opportunity, if you're not a person of faith, to have that conversation over a meal. And it's going to be great. And if you're already a person of faith, it equips you to be able to share your faith because you are now aware of the questions that people are asking that don't know Jesus already as their Lord and Savior. And what are those barriers? And it helps you to be prepared to give an answer. Does that make sense? We're going to invite people into that opportunity. Now, we're going to we're going to be making an effort in growing our small groups ministry as we move forward and bear with us as we do that over the next number of weeks and months. And as we gather together next week, we'll dive a little deeper in our vision and some of our values as to how this stuff is going to play out. But we want to invite you to be a part of that. We want to let you know as well that we're going to make some changes this summer to the timing of our summer services. Now, we'll still have gatherings on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., but they're going to be prayer meetings. And our actual service, are you re- I don't know if they're ready for this, Eileen. I don't know. You know what? I, uh, see, the thing is, Eileen, I just get excited about being in the center of where I believe God is calling us. And then every once in a while, I share it with another leader, what we're doing, and then I realize how crazy I sound. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do, church. Every weekend during the summer, what do people usually do? They go to camp, right? But unless you're retired, what do you have to do every Monday morning? go to work. What do you not want to do when you come home from camp? Make supper. That's right. Eileen knows the answers here. (laughs) Make supper. So here's what we're going to do. Our gatherings on Sundays for July and August will be at 5 p.m. and it will include a free community barbecue and our services will be at 545 to 7 p.m. and we're going to talk through. Yeah, somebody's excited over there. There we go. We're going to talk through just the topic of life after death. We're going to talk about near-death experiences and talk about heaven and what happens after we die. We're looking for opportunities where faith and culture intersect with one another. And we have an opportunity to build relationship in our community and invite people to take steps to move closer to Jesus. I want to invite you to be a part of it. I want to invite you to serve, to be a bringer, to invite somebody. Because disciples invite and disciples invite serve. And so there's opportunity for us to plug in in every part along the mission. You know, we're going to be talking about our mission and our our vision over and over and over again until we're living it and breathing it and we're almost getting bored of it because we talk about it so much and then we're going to do it again. Because here's the thing, I heard somebody tell me once that mission and vision are like a bowl of water. And as you try and scoop up the water in your hands, what happens? It begins to trickle down. Water will find that place that it can just eke out. And our mission and vision can do exactly the same thing. And so what do we have to do? We have to keep coming back to the well of what God has spoken to us already and reminding and encouraging one another of what it is that he's called us to do, to love God, to love others, and make disciples. And the way that we're seeing that happening is to take steps to move closer to Jesus. I want to finish this morning by sharing a story with you. I should have brought a towel up. I want to share a story with you. And, uh, and I don't know uh, if you kind of figured this out yet or not, but the egg hunt did exactly that. You know, we had so many people attending, and, and we shared with everybody the gospel message of Jesus, right? Now, we did it in a way that that the kids had a blast, right? We had a boxing match between death and Jesus, right? And and Adam, and um, Pastor John played Adam for us, and Adam, Della Mirandier, played death. And uh, and he wasn't intending to, but he actually 
connected with Pastor John. And, uh, and so, like, I thought that was hilarious, right? It just added to the experience. And then we made an invitation to join us on Sunday morning and, and to continue to send, ask permission to continue to send information about other family events that we have. I want to share with you just one specific story of the 300-something stories that there are from that day. Um, our son's kindergarten teacher was here in the room. Now, I didn't know that she was here until after, and, you know, Stephanie ended up filling me in with this story. But she said to Stephanie, I saw the egg hunt. We heard about it, and we decided not to go. We decided not to go. But then I saw that video that your husband put on Facebook, and it was just so friendly. I just thought, how, why wouldn't I go? I don't know if you're aware, but we put this video together just answering frequently asked questions about what it's like at Cornerstone. And within a week, it had 3,100 views and was shared 15 times in our community. It went like small town viral. And she sees this video, right? She sees this video and she said, I had decided not to go. But then I saw that video and it just seemed so friendly. And I thought, why wouldn't we go? My daughter has never been to church before. And so I thought this was the perfect opportunity to bring her. And so she comes in on that Saturday morning for the egg hunt with this throng of people and kids who are on a, about to be on a sugar high and then a sugar crash when they get home later that day. And uh, she says to Stephanie on her way out, she said, you know what? This was really fun. And I think I'd like to come back on a Sunday. Sometimes people are at this place in their faith with Jesus, where they've just decided that they don't want anything to do with it. And then we have this place over here where we're completely sold out, knowing that Jesus loves us and he died for our sins, and so it changes the way that we live moving forward. But you know what, church? There's, there's not just one step in between. It's not just one giant leap that everybody makes that decision in a single moment. Now, sometimes that happens, and it's amazing. But we want to help people to take steps to move closer to Jesus. And here's this person in our community that we have relationship with. And she's decided that even though before she had no intention and desire to enter the place at all, she decided to come and try it out. And she had such a great experience that she's decided that she's open to coming back. And couldn't you imagine seeing her this summer as we meet for our family barbecues and our conversations about faith and, and having an invitation for Asher's kindergarten teacher to join us for uh, Alpha? coming this fall. So here's my question for you. Will you join us? Can you get behind this mission and this vision that as a leadership we've prayed over and we feel that God is leading us to and we know that there are going to be challenges. We know that this is not three to five weeks worth of work. This is three to five years worth of work. But we know that God is faithful. And as we pursue what it is that he has laid on our heart and as we do that with you know, like we're praying like it depends on him and we're working like it depends on us. That we see God move in our community. Can we pray together? Is that okay? Father, we're so thankful and we're excited for what it is that you have laid on our hearts and really have, you've really been preparing that for a while and, and you've just taken this season to highlight it and, and bring it to the surface. And so we commit it to you today, God. We commit it to you and we just declare, we purpose in our own hearts that we are all in to what you are calling us to do. To love you, to love others, and to make disciples. And Father, we know that as we are faithful, that you are faithful as well. And so we come with faithful expectation, anticipation, and excitement of what it is that you are already beginning to accomplish in this community for your kingdom. And so we just hand it back to you, and we pray all of this, that it would glorify you in your mighty name. And we pray this in the name of King Jesus. And if you're on board with us, would you say amen? amen. Amazing. Amazing, guys. I hope you're excited. It's going to be a good day.